the spring evening of the 22nd of May, 1844, about an hour past sunset in a home in Shiraz, Persia, a manifestation of God made himself known. The person hearing this recalls a moment. This revelation, so suddenly and impetuously thrust upon me, came as a thunderbolt, which for a time seemed to have benumbed my faculties. I was blinded by its dazzling splendor and overwhelmed by its crushing force. Excitement, joy, awe, and wonder stirred the depths of my soul. This was a claim to be no less than the mouthpiece of God himself, promised by the prophets of the bygone ages, the assertion that he was, at the same time, the herald of one immeasurably greater than himself. This new faith renews the truths of the past and delivers to all mankind the prescription for healing the woes of mankind. This initial message signals the end of one era and the inception of a glorious period, bringing mankind to a sustainable and hopeful world for every soul, a world humankind has never seen. Accompanying this revelation, certain progress must be made to close the gap of things like communications, to fulfill the purpose of this new dawn. Making over humanity from its deeply embedded and rigid patterns of life will require new tools to reach all of mankind. It is God that deems that humankind needs enlightenment for the enormous task at hand, so a breath of ingenuity and creativity wafts over mankind. In this era of enlightenment, there bursts forth a great leap forward in achievements, ideas, and inventive advancements to support the cause of God for the benefit of mankind. In the United States, 6,700 miles away from Shiraz, Persia, where the great announcement had been given only 27 hours before, a vital demonstration occurred at 8.30 a.m., on May 24, 1844. This message was sent on a 38-mile-long single wire from the Supreme Court located in the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. to Mount Clare Station in Baltimore, Maryland. It carried a single line. This is more than a coincidental message. That message was, What hath God wrought? Who was this fellow that brought this about, this world-changing technology? Samuel F. B. Morse, born in 1791, born while George Washington was President of the United States. He was a quiet man, raised by religious zealots. Morse became gifted and a prolific painter who painted the portraits of Presidents John Adams and James Monroe, and the inventor Eli Whitney and photography. He is somewhat credited with bringing photography to the United States. He gave the first lectures on art in America, became the first professor of fine arts at an American college, and founded the National Academy of Design. A Republican idealist, prominent in antebellum politics, he ran for Congress and for mayor of New York. But his enduring legacy came as the inventor of the American Electromagnetic Telegraph and brought him, at the age of 53, the fame he sought. On a return trip from France in October 1832, the idea for a telegraph came to him. He shared his thoughts about this revolutionary invention with many on board. The skepticism from Congress about this idea was powerful some suggesting that it would be better to give this money to a mesmerizer than to Morse. Those kind of comments show just how unbelievable this idea of communicating across vast distances seemed. So, with many trials and tribulations of competing inventors and his own government, it took nearly 12 years to get the U.S. government to finance the project. Morse was on the brink of financial collapse until the government's action. This was the first time the U.S. government supported an outside private venture. The pain and challenges were very daunting until 1843 when funding was granted. Items such as making the wire, the tube, 
digging the 38-mile trench. There were so many other areas that were completely new that other inventions were needed to accomplish this project. Piled on top of that were people who wanted their share of the pie. Many people making parts couldn't complete the request, therefore the plan and hope to get this all done before winter 1843 failed. The delays in winter weather stopped the progress until spring. What is the origin of that phrase, what hath God wrought? It is from the Bible and the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers begins at Mount Sinai, where the Israelites have received their laws and covenant from God, and God has taken up residence among them in the sanctuary. The book of Numbers is the culmination of the story of Israel's exodus from the oppression in Egypt and their journey to take possession of the land God promised their fathers. How was this phrase selected? Samuel Morse's classmate from Yale, who was also the commissioner of patents, had a daughter, Annie Ellsworth, who was invited to compose the first message. He spoke of her as my dear young friend and was rumored to be romantically interested. But the invitation explained was a form of thanks. When Congress passed the appropriation bill for the building of the telegraph line, it was Annie who brought him the news. In thinking up an appropriate message, she consulted her mother, who suggested the exclamation of the prophetic Balaam. While this video focused on one invention that put mankind on a new trajectory, it is important to comprehend that tied to this messenger of God's revelation, and as the gate to another messenger of God greater than himself, whose own ministry leads us to world salvation, are also the material advancements coming in such rapidity that no time in history has its equal. Look at the monumental advances this phenomenal era brings. Walking was the only way man traveled on land until about 6,000 years ago when horses were domesticated for travel, and it remained that way until the first public railway was built in 1830. Then, 75 years later, in 1885, the car is invented, expanding rapid travel to the individual. People for water transport started using sails 7,000 years ago until 1815, when steamships came to be, and taking us out of the darkness effectively became available to the public in the 1880s. This turning point in the physical advances are part of human advancement that accompany a new religion, a religion that delivers the sustaining elements for future generations to employ in a growing world where rubbing against each other's culture, religion, skin color, nation, language, social class, political positions is causing much friction with tragic consequences. Among this new faith, these tenets were declared, and many of these principles are today accepted without blinking an eye, but in the 1800s, when they were issued, oh my gosh, like the inventions they were profound in their effect on human life. Independent search after truth. Elimination of prejudices of all kinds. Equality of men and women. Universal education. Essential harmony of science and religion. Elimination of the extremes of wealth and poverty. Universal Auxiliary Language Oneness of Mankind Oneness of God Oneness of Religion